let's talk about human rights. Human rights is, of course, from a policy perspective, one of the biggest projects of the cosmopolitan perspective. Uh, it's been a fairly powerful one, for better or for worse. It's shaped a lot of international discourse. Um, there are some reasons for skepticism about its triumphal nature, but it's hard to deny that the fact that human rights have become, especially since World War II, a major focus of the way we think about and understand international relations, uh, it's, it's hard to avoid that. Even if you think that ultimately realism rules the day, states still do just whatever is in their national interest, the fact remains that that national interest has been translated through a kind of discourse of universal human rights in ways that has shaped and changed it, uh, you know, even if it is only the lip service that uh, vice pays to virtue. All right, so there are a few big issues, though, about human rights as a policy project and human rights as a theoretical construct. The most fundamental one is, once we start talking about human rights, we have to ask questions about what human rights are there? Um, are human rights a comprehensive morality that applies to everyone? Are they some kind of bare moral minimum uh, that applies to everyone precisely because it is a moral minimum, it's not all of morality? Where do we draw the line? Um, what is their metaphysical nature? Where do they come from? Uh, and of course, when we think about them as a policy rather than just as a kind of idea, we get into some very difficult questions about who should decide what kinds of things are human rights, what human rights there are. We might all agree that there are some universal human rights, we might all agree that there is a universal morality. We might not, but we might all agree on this and still disagree that putting the ability to determine for practical purposes what the content of that morality is in one or another set of hands is problematic. Uh, and this applies as a problem more or less no matter whose hands you think it should be in, there are legitimate criticisms. Uh, very often the way this, this kind of concern manifests is with people criticizing things like the United States presuming to determine when other countries are in violation of human rights and impose unilateral sanctions or of course most spectacularly engage in military interventions. But at the same time if you want to say, oh, well, only the United Nations should be able to determine that there are systematic human rights violations somewhere, other people might reasonably say, well, why should, why should that be, right? The United Nations is made up of representatives from all sorts of countries, many of which are by a number of plausible standards, not particularly respectful of human rights. Why should we think that the United Nations judgment is necessarily any better than the United States judgment or China's judgment or Bangladesh's judgment or or wherever. So I, I unfortunately I, I, I will I will give you a spoiler. I don't have a definitive answer to that question that you will get by the end of this discussion. One particular corollary of this is there's a very common argument that human rights are culturally bound. They are essentially a kind of Western concept. Um, they are also often accused of essentially being a kind of individualistic concept. So you have criticism both from communitarians, even within the Western tradition, that say, look, this the, the human rights as they are understood in the international policy realm are problematically individualist. They don't pay attention to all of the things that we talked about communitarians caring about. They don't pay enough attention to 
the importance of unchosen community. They don't pay enough attention to the ways in which the group, the well-being of the group may be more important than the well-being of the individual. On the other hand, you have more culturally based critiques that essentially say these are an outgrowth of a particular Western European way of looking at the world that does not comport with the morality of other cultures. Historically, as it turns out, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the sort of core UN document, um, they did have representatives from other cultures besides European ones on the drafting committee. I know they had a, a Confucian in particular. They had folks from, I don't think they had any Africans, if I remember correctly, but they had folks from Latin America and from, from Asia on the drafting committee. But even there, the argument is that the drafting committee was disproportionately representative of Westerners. And even many of the non-Westerners were Western educated and so may have had views that were influenced by Western culture um, more than, or at least as much as by their native cultures. So if we're claiming they're universal, this is problematic, right? Um, it is of course possible that even if they are in some way characteristic of Western culture, it is of course possible that, uh, you know, Western culture has gotten it right and everyone else has gotten it wrong. But when you put it that way, it sounds fairly implausible. Um, and so this raises questions of, is there any such thing as a universally binding human right? Or do we just have the values of our particular cultures? The, the question, the fundamental question of moral relativism. Um, and from a more practical perspective, it raises the question of whether the human rights project as a policy movement for lack of a better term, is sincere, well-meaning, idealistic, but covertly imperialist or inherently imperialistic, um, inherently a way of trying to impose values through coercive force to some extent on cultures that, that do not share those values naturally. And of course, all of this from a policy perspective leads up to you know, where the rubber meets the road. If you're just, just worried about the theory, okay, let the philosophers argue about it. But where the rubber meets the road for human rights is in the question of, should we use coercive tools to um, get people to follow human rights, to get countries to follow human, right, human rights standards? Should we use international sanctions? Should we use military force? Should we exclude... Um, countries from membership in international organizations. We use all of these levers of power to compel countries to adhere to international human rights standards. Okay. Obviously, just to set this up, obviously, if there are true human rights and the kinds of things that you find on the lists are basically what they are, that doesn't get you all the way, but it gives you pretty good reasons for saying, yeah, maybe we should be able to coerce people to follow these. But if they're just parochial Western ideas, then, you know, it, it's, it's a lot less plausible that it is morally justified to use various kinds of coercion to get countries to go along with them. So, wh what are these things? Let's just clarify this notion of a right from a theoretical perspective. Some of this is going to sound kind of pedantic, but it actually can matter not to slide around too much on these things. So, first of all, um, rights have a kind of dual structure. This is something that, that is usually identified with a legal, the legal theorist Hofeld. But the basic idea is this. Every right essentially has kind of two parts. One part of it is that it gives someone a claim, right? It gives someone a claim that they can then apply to other people. They can make on other people about something. And the other part of it is, on the side of the person who the claim is being made against, it gives someone else an obligation to do something. Right. So rights always involve at least two people. One person who has a claim and one person who has an obligation. Usually they have more than two. So one kind of right 
is involved with prohibitions on action. These are sometimes called negative rights. These are, in a nutshell, rights that I might have that someone not do something to me. So take, for instance, um, the right against torture on almost every list of, of international human rights. I have a claim that I not be tortured. If you attempt to torture me, I, I deploy that moral claim. I say, you can't torture me. I have, I have a right not to be tortured. And you have an obligation not to torture me. In fact, as with very many negative rights, if we ask, well, who has the obligation not to torture me? Everyone. Everyone has the obligation not to torture me. So negative rights often look like that. They're prohibitions on action, which means that each of us has a claim that applies to everybody else in the world that they are obliged not to do certain things to us. Now, to, to have a sort of a picture of this, if all we had were negative rights, everyone's rights could be respected in a world where nobody interacted with anyone ever, right? Because if, you know, if no one is doing anything to you, then they're, they're certainly not doing forbidden things to you. The other kind of right that is often proposed are what are sometimes called positive rights. These are requirements of action. Um, and they are, they are sort of intuitively the rights to something. So if you say, for instance, that I, if I say I have a right to food, basically this means I have a claim that somebody give me food if I don't otherwise have it, or somebody make it possible for me to get food. The obligation then applies to whoever is obliged to respond to that claim. Positive rights have a slightly more complicated structure on the obligation side because they raise a harder version of the question of who is the one who has the obligation. As long as we're talking about negative rights like torture, it's pretty simple. Everyone has the obligation not to torture me. Everyone has the obligation not to arbitrarily detain or kill me, right? If you say, I have a right to food, well, then you ask the question, well, who has the obligation to give me food or, or ensure that I, can, that I obtain food? Um, if I if I don't have it, everyone seems weird. We don't normally treat it that way. Um, even people who believe that there is a right to food don't typically say, "Well, this means that you know, take a place that." I don't want to get too much into the controversies on this, right? But take North Korea. North Korea is often held up as a situation where the right to food is being violated. We don't typically take this to mean that, you know, North Koreans, should they be able to, could sort of walk into my house and just start taking food out of my fridge to eat, right? Maybe I'd be a nice guy if I gave starving people food to eat. But we don't take it that they have a right to that. Or even starving people in Baltimore, right? We don't need to, you know, if, if someone had a right, right? So take something like theft. If I stole something from someone, right? I have, they have a right that I not steal from them. If I stole something from someone, it would make sense, morally at least, for them to, you know, if they saw it in my backyard, to, like, come into my backyard and get it. Um, you know, and we would, that might cause a confrontation, right, but we would let them back that up with the police. We don't really typically think of the right to food in the same way. We don't think that, start, even if I say, yeah, I think people in Baltimore have a right to food, that typically doesn't mean that I think that they can come into my house and just take my food because they have a right to it. So we get a harder, anyway, there's a long way around the block of saying we have a harder question about who the obligation applies to. In terms of international human rights, very often the default, at least the, the, the practical default, is to say some version of, well, the state. The state has the obligation to provide for those rights. Very often when we talk about things like a right to food, what we mean, at least people who defend the idea of a right to food, mean is that whoever state it is has an obligation to provide food to make sure that they can get food um, if, if people don't have it. Okay. That's just sort of concept of a right. It, it's nerdy. Don't worry about it that much. Okay. What makes it a human right, typically, is that when we talk about human rights, we're talking about things that are possessed, rights that are possessed by all human beings merely in virtue of being human. Some rights I have because of who I am particularly, right? Um, I have a right to enter my home unimpeded because I own it. That's not a human right. A human right is the sort of thing that everybody has 
regardless of, of their social position, regardless of what they may have done. Um, you know, it's just if you are a member of the human species, you have human rights. That's at least the concept. In particular, they're universal, they're international, they're cross-cultural, doesn't matter where you were born to have them. Uh, at least, like I said, again, this is the concept. We may not buy that there are such things. Typically, they're also thought to be inalienable, which means two things. I can't give them away, right? If I have a right not to be tortured, I can't say, no, it's, it's cool, you can torture me, go ahead, right? There might be some weird questions about, like, if I consent to the infliction of pain, is it torture, right? But however we want to define torture, most people would say, I can't alienate that right. I can't voluntarily give it away. It also can't be stripped from me. I don't have it in virtue of following the rules. I have it just in virtue of being human. So most defenders of the human rights concept would say that no matter what I've done, horrible terrorist mastermind, child murderer, serial rapist, right, whatever, I retain my human rights. You might be able to punish me in various ways, but you can't punish me in ways that violate my human rights. So you, this is the sort of idea that like, you know, look, we put murderers in prison, but we don't, we can't torture them would be, would be the kind of idea behind this. So nothing I do can remove these rights from me is usually the idea. And finally, and this is especially uh, the way it plays out in policy thought, is human rights are generally thought of as in opposition to the moral claims of sovereignty, tradition, and religion. Essentially, to them, this is why they get tagged as individualist by a lot of people. They are often conceived of as fundamentally in opposition to the moral claims of groups. The idea is that why we need to focus on human rights is that too often states will say things like, look, well, we need to torture some people to maintain the integrity of the state. We need to torture some people to, to keep everyone safe. And human rights defenders will typically say that's exactly where we need human rights. We need human rights precisely to give a moral and ideally, many people would say, legal claim that individuals have the same no. The state cannot, even for reasonable purposes, the state cannot violate my rights. I can assert them against the state. Um, and in fact, I mean, part of this, I don't want to make it sound as if I'm, this is, it's only when they're reasonable, right? Part of this is the conviction on the part of many people who are staunch defenders of human rights that states ethnic groups, religious groups, typically don't have good reasons for violating the rights of the individuals, but they work with a moral concept that makes it seem like we ought to sacrifice individuals for the group, and human rights as a moral concept is one that's a, that typically is understood to say no. Individuals may not, at least in certain respects, may not be sacrificed for the, for the interest of the group. Okay. So, um, let me do a quick taxonomy. Uh, there are different types of rights. We can sort of get into this. Um, part of the reason for talking about this is that even among people who believe there are some human rights, uh, not everyone believes that in the same list of rights that there could be. And often the distinction is not on the basis of just, oh, you know, torture is, is not a thing, right? Uh, that, that's a disagreement on individual rights. Often the reason for disagreement is, has to do with the idea that certain kinds of things can't be human rights. And other people say no, certain classes of things can be human rights. The biggest divide is on what we've talked about before, negative positive rights. There is a large strand of folks who basically want to say no, there are only negative rights. There can't be positive rights. There's no, there's a right that you can't be tortured, there's a right that you can't be arbitrarily killed or imprisoned, but there can't be a right to food. There can't be a right to health care. Um, there can't be rights that require that other people give you stuff. There can only be rights that require that other people stay out of your way, right? Um, of course, you can sort of hear echoes of libertarianism in the negative rights only concept, but it's not, it's not only the libertarians who hold this view. Um, 
various kinds of liberals have held some version of the, you know, there are only negative rights, there are no positive rights kinds of views. Uh, if you get down, down a little bit more into the weeds, the kinds of classes that people argue about whether or not there could be rights of this type, um, and these are sort of vaguely in ascending order of controversy, but don't place too much weight on that. Um, one class would be personal rights and liberties. Um, the readings sort of get into this taxonomy. So freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly. Uh, one class are what are sometimes called rule of law rights. These are basically procedural rights, things like the right to a fair trial, um, the right to confront witnesses, um, the right to, uh, you know, the, the right to have laws be publicly promulgated. Uh, these are a little bit of a weird class on the one hand. They're often considered very fundamental, and they probably are pretty fundamental. On the other hand, they are pretty contextual to legal systems like the ones we have here in the West, and so they, they, are, they are sometimes challenged as sort of not being real rights or being only contextual expressions of more fundamental rights. Uh, political rights, these overlap to some extent with personal rights and liberties, but they're understood a little bit differently. So freedom of speech understood as a personal right is, you know, my right to say whatever I want. Freedom of speech understood as a political right is particularly my right to participate in the political discourse. Most people who defend something like freedom of speech will tend to defend both. But, uh, you know, there can be variation, especially depending on where you put the emphasis. So, for instance, many countries have stronger regulations on both hate speech and pornography than the United States has. And part of that is because in the United States there's a stronger, it's not absolute, go find an ACLU lawyer to explain the ins and outs. In the United States there is a stronger tradition of understanding freedom of speech as importantly a personal right or liberty. And so the idea that we can restrict speech that is problematic if it does not contribute to, you know, the political dialogue is one that's been brought up again and again in the U.S., but it's never really taken root the same way it has in other places. Whereas, you know, Canada has much stricter um, anti-pornography, anti-obscenity laws than the United States has on the theory that, look, Obscenity is not a contribution to political discourse. It's not as important to protect as speech. Um, a lot of European countries have stronger hate speech laws, uh, anti-hate speech laws than the U.S. does, because it's under the, the, the idea behind it is that being able to say hateful things about some group is dangerous and it's not protected because we're not understanding this is a fundamental moral right of individuals just to say what they want or what they believe, but as being able to contribute to the political discourse and... At least the argument is that hate speech doesn't contribute to the, you know, saying vile things about some group doesn't contribute to political discourse in a way that's protected. Okay. Um, most of these three, except for some of the rule of law stuff, um, these three categories tend to be heavily leaning towards negative rights. Not entirely, but heavily leaning in that direction. Um, and then the leaning positive classes, you have economic and social rights. These are typically individual rights to the goods of society. So on this list, you often find things like a right to food, a right to health care. Some people will argue for a right to a basic income, um, right to, um, yeah, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about uh, a right to the, the, the fruits of science um, and, and, and even actually a, a right to paid vacations. Right? So these are economic and social rights. And then you have communal and cultural rights. Some of these are still individualistic. So a right to speak the language of your community. right? Um, but some people will also want to put rights that are inherently held by groups on this kind of list. So though in general human rights as a concept is associated with individualism, there are folks who want to say that, no, the individuals have human rights, but groups also can have human rights or group rights. So the idea would be not just that 
I ought to be able to be allowed to speak the lang whatever language I please, right? The language of my culture. Um, we should not have laws like uh, Turkey has had that um, ban or restrict the speaking of Kurdish, right? That, that violates someone's rights. But also that the group itself has rights. So um, there might be a, a moral obligation for a state to ensure the survival of certain kinds of subcultural groups. And of course, this is going to interact in complicated ways with the more individualistic side of human rights, if you think that there are such things. Okay, uh, this slide is really, I'm not gonna read it, but um, if you wanna get the list, you can look at the, um, the PowerPoint. These are uh, very international, uh, Human rights, of course, is not just a moral concept. It's become influential in international, international law. There's a bunch of treaties. There are more things that deal with this that, that are not even on here. Um, so you might consider, for instance, the rules of international humanitarian law, basically the laws of war as also being human rights treaties in a certain way. Um, this is the list. Uh, it's got the year that the treaty came into force um, on it, but uh, of course, the U.S. not every country is a party to all of these treaties. In fact, the U.S. is not a party to several of the important ones like the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights um, or the uh, Convention on the um, Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. <clears throat> uh, you can look, there are lists that show, you know, whether your country has signed up to, uh, to various ones or ratified various ones. Um, there is, of course, we can get into this, I'm just going to gloss it for right now, but we can get into this. There is, of course, some debate about the importance of treaties. So to take the U.S. Um, example, very often human rights campaigners will, with some justification, complain about things like the fact that the United States is not a party to CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And we'll say, you know, quite plausibly, look, why, why aren't we? You know, I mean, the reason we aren't is, is political, um, as you might imagine. Uh, there are some provisions of CEDAW that some members of Congress think would require the United States to um, take a more liberal stance towards abortion, uh, especially with foreign funding. Um, or towards prostitution. They don't like that. There's, again, I don't want to get into the details of the law. There's some debate about whether it would actually do that, but that's the view um, that, that people have that has led to the blockage. But, so, you know, so human rights campaigners will, with some justification, look at the U.S. and say, look, why haven't you ratified CEDAW? You're beholden to conservative members of your legislature that just don't care that much about women's rights. Um, you know, this is a horrible thing. It should be ratified. On the flip side, again, with some justification, people will say, look, how important is this really? CEDAW has been ratified by a number of countries. I think Pakistan is on the list, actually, who, you know, legitimately have much worse records on women women's rights than the United States does. You know, recently, as I'm recording this, uh, we've had a lot of flap about um, various people's statements on rape um, in Congress. But on the other hand, it's, you know, if you had to pick where you would live as a woman, you'd probably still pick the United States most of the time over a place like Pakistan, um, is, is, you know, is how the, how the argument goes. So um, it's not as if ratifying international treaties is the end all and be all. And one of the sort of combination policy and moral questions people have about human rights is, where should, if you, even if you, if we take as a given that you care about human rights, where should the effort be focused? Does focusing it on the plane of international law um, actually make that much of a difference? And there are both right, sort of right-leaning and left-leaning critiques of this. Right-leaning critics of the international law focus, in a nutshell, will say, you know, what's most important is powerful states with good human rights records like the United States um, making sure that other people don't violate it um, and not being beholden to paper treaties that can get used against them. Um, on the left, critics of sort of human rights as international law 
will say things like, well, you know, you're not going to solve the fundamental problems by passing some rules on paper, right? The fundamental problem of women's rights is about women's social and economic position in society, um, <clears throat> saying, oh, you know, it's very important to uh, respect women's rights while not changing any of the fundamentals will not actually move the needle in any meaningful way. Um, and I'm picking on CEDAW, but mutatis mutandis for many of the other, uh, other rights on the list. So, what would make something a human right? We've talked a little bit about what they would be, um, but how do we figure out what should be what should be on our list? The old phraseology that was sometimes used in international law was that it's something that shocks the conscience of mankind. Um, but this runs us right back into the relativism problem, of course, which is that you know what shocks my conscience and what shocks your conscience may be different. Uh, the confidence that there is some fundamental moral commonality uh, among people is one that eh, a lot of people are pretty skeptical of now, um, even more so than they were, you know, mid 20th century when human rights as a policy project was really um, gathering, you know, really sort of the modern policy project of human rights really gained a lot of steam. <laughs> So we might have to look a little bit more theoretically at this. One proposal is that human rights are there to protect against acts with especially bad consequences, right? Genocide ends up on this list because genocide is horrible, right? Um, so this is basically a kind of consequentialist justification. Not everything that's bad will count as a human right, right? If you're a utilitarian, you're going to take human rights to be at best rules of thumb. Right, you're going to say, well, you know, we're, there's no such thing as a right. It's all about what causes the most good. But rules of thumb are like, you know, genocide, don't do it. It's very unlikely it would cause the most good. But leaving the utilitarians aside for the moment, one possibility is that you could you could draw a line around only the the acts with the most grievous consequences. So genocide will end up on the list. Um, other kinds of things like. Um, you know, because of the connections with political repression, freedom of speech maybe ends up on the list, right? Those sorts of things. But this is, I think, a, a plausible and attractive way to go. The only drawback is it, it, it doesn't, it interacts weirdly with the list of human rights that most people have, right? With sort of the dominant consensus lists that tend to go around. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, maybe so much the worse for our lists, but <clears throat> for instance, aggressive war doesn't usually show up on the list of human rights in any direct way, right? Even though aggressive war, of course, can have really horrible consequences. On the other hand, there are some things, I mean, this causes weirdness for certain other things, right? So torture is a core element of many people's lists, but if you're looking just at consequences, it looks a little bit weird, right? There are a lot of worse things. I mean, it looks weird, uh, you know, in the sense that if you say, look, we're going to, we, you have a choice. We can kill you or torture you. I mean, probably killing is worse, right? It's at least ambivalent. It would be hard to, you'd have to give a fancy argument to convince people that in general torture was just worse, a consequence. Um, in fact, they seem fundamentally incomparable to a lot of people. So a lot of people have wanted to say, well, no, it's actually, and this is one of the, the focus of one of the readings, it's actually that the what makes something a human right is not that the consequences are particular bad, particularly bad, right? There are a lot of things that have really bad consequences, like, um, you know, the economic collapse has had horrible consequences, right? If you just took this up in a utilitarian way, arguably much worse than, uh, you know, anyone being tortured, right? It's much worse to be tortured for the person being tortured, but we don't we don't torture as many people as are touched by the economic crisis. Nonetheless, it would be weird for most people to say, well, we have a right, what do we have? We have a right against economic crises? Um, so some people want to say, well, what's going on is that s the concept of human rights is tied to the fundamental nature of humanity. So there are certain kinds of acts that fundamentally deny people their humanity. 
you can harm people in lots of ways that don't deny their humanity, right? If two honorable soldiers face off in, in you know, lawful combat, the argument would be that that's a it can be a harm. Right? You kill me in combat, I'm just as dead as if you murder me. Um, but that doesn't deny my humanity. But torturing me in some fundamental way denies my humanity. Um, raping someone in some fundamental way denies their humanity. You, you convert them into something animal-like or thing-like in your view. You're treating them as an animal or a thing. Um, you're degrading them in a way that is specific to the concept of humanity. It's incompatible with the concept of humanity. So this is a very different kind of thing. You're not saying that the consequences in some kind of utilitarian way are worse, right? You're not saying that, like torture is more painful than death. Right? You're saying that torture assaults fundamental humanity in a way that lots of kinds of death don't. And of course, the last, you know, if you, if you have no patience for all of this reflection on the nature of the human being, um, you might just say, well, no, actually, maybe it's just what everyone can agree on. <laughs> maybe it's just consensus. That's, that's, that's what gets us something being a human right. Lowest common denominator. So what do we say about this last thing? Let's grapple extremely briefly and inadequately with the question of uh, relativism. The problem is that descriptive relativism is almost certainly true. It is very hard to argue with the idea that different cultures, in fact, believe different things about morality, and, and particularly believe different things about what rights people have. Right Through time and across geography, people have had different beliefs about stuff. That's, it's really hard to argue with that. So this gets us back to the who decides question. Even on a theoretical basis, the question would be, what, what makes me think that, or what could justify anyone in thinking that, well, look, people have disagreed about stuff, but some of them are right and some of them are wrong. Um, and you need some kind of theoretical argument if you want to try to make that case. If you want to try to avoid that, there are a couple, the, the, the basic way you would try to do that, if you want to try to avoid that, is to say, well, maybe even though there's lots of variation, maybe there is a kind of, Rawls uses the term, overlapping consensus, or a sort of lowest common denominator. And a lot of human rights advocates have wanted to take this tack. They've wanted to say things like, look, sure, cultures differ on a lot of things, but there's no culture that says, torture is great and you should do it, right? Now, we can get into some anthropological arguments about this, but um, Nussbaum, for instance, has, has made basically this kind of argument. There are some things that are moral universals. There's no culture that endorses these things. Um, and human rights, human rights advocates, uh, human rights lawyers, um, policy folks have, have often wanted to take that stand because it's metaphysically less weighty. Right? You're not saying, I have some privileged access to moral reality. You're just saying, let's focus on the things we can all agree on. We might disagree on what laws for who can be executed should look like, but we can all agree that states should not just be able to execute whoever they decide to um, without following some kind of transparent legal procedure. We might disagree on some details of what the boundaries of what torture is, but we can all agree that torture, however we define it, is wrong. And at the very least, that gives us some context for arguing about the boundaries, right? We know what's going on if we're arguing about waterboarding in the context of an agreed understanding of basically that torture is wrong and what it amounts to, then we at least even have a context for arguing about whether or not t waterboarding counts as torture. Um, so one possibility is to look for this low lowest common denominator. Of course, the skeptical note is a lot of people have said, I don't, you know, it doesn't seem like there is one. It's not, it's not clear that there is something that everybody in the world accepts, everybody's culture accepts even. Um, and of course, the realists, not the political realists, the moral realists, the people who believe there is a single true morality out there, um, also will note their own, sound their own note of skepticism, which is to say, don't move too quickly from the fact that people do not, in fact, accept a common set of human rights principles to the idea that 
there is not a set of principles that people should accept, right? So they'll at least say the argument is too quick if what you say is, well, look, people believe different things, therefore there are no human rights. Um, or countries don't all give people the same legal rights, therefore there are no human rights, right? That's the kind of thing that led Jeremy Bentham to say, look, human rights is nonsense on stilts. Um, they'll say, no, look, the fact that not everyone gives legal effect to human rights doesn't mean that they are not morally enforced. It's just wrong to not have laws that enforce them. Again, I do not have an answer I can give you right now to the question of are they universal, but in a lot of ways it's one of the very fundamental questions of, um, of human rights. Or maybe not. doesn't matter. Um, two big questions really come up here when you start trying to wonder if, if it matters if they're universal. The typical reason why people worry about the universality of human rights, as I mentioned before, is because the idea that they are absolute and universal is often closely tied to the idea that it is morally legitimate to use coercive means to get countries and individuals to comport with human rights standards. If you are a universalist, if you are a realist, if you believe there are universal human rights, again, you have a pretty good argument, at least the beginnings of a pretty good argument, for saying, yeah, it's okay for us to impose principles that we know to be right, uh, even if the people we're imposing them on don't agree, even if the people we're trying to benefit don't agree, right? Even if the people who, who we think whose rights are being violated don't think their own rights are being violated. Um, one particular place where this comes up a lot, uh, I think there's some complications about the about the testimony people people appeal to, but is with things like um, uh, female genital mutilation, uh, FGM, right? Some people will say, look, it's not just that the culture that we're imposing this on, you know, um, Liberian culture for one. In parts of some in some subcultures in Liberia, it's still practiced. It's not just that the culture, in some broad sense, doesn't agree that this is a violation of of women's rights. So, people some people will say, look, the women themselves who we are trying to save, quote unquote, don't agree. Um, but if you're a universalist, you don't have to worry that much about it. You know, you can just say, look, well, we're right, and it's important. The flip side of this is that. You might say, look, even if we were right, we should not impose things, right? We should always and only use human rights as a kind of discourse to convince people to do things, a framework for discussing them. Then on that, on that side of things, it may not matter that much if they're not universal, right? If all you're using is non-coercive methods. Um, and the last little theoretical curlicue on this question about universality is people who say that human rights are not universal typically appeal to some form of um, culturally relativist argument, not an individually relativist one. You know, ever, not that uh, each person has different views, but that each culture has different views. And this raises some questions that have come up in the class before, essentially about whether or not cultures are fixed. If it doesn't make sense to talk about the culture as a unique and fairly coherent entity to which individuals belong, cultural relativism at least has to look a lot different than the way it normally does. Right? The way it normally looks are in things like the um, one popular critique of, of mainstream human rights is what's sometimes called the Asian values approach. Um, probably a little bit of a caricature of quote-unquote Asian values, but that's what it's called, pushed um, famously by Le uh, uh, the former president of Singapore. Uh, and the, you know, the idea that in Asian cultures, the group is valued over the individual. This is a pretty broad brushstroke picture of what Asian cultures are about. Um, and if there is no such thing as Asian culture in a coherent way that can support this, it causes a lot of problems for that kind of critique. Right. Okay, so to sum up, there's a lot to talk about with human rights. Um, I certainly didn't get it all in in this relatively short discussion. Um, 
We'll try to get to some more in class. People who believe that there are human rights think that they're somehow tied to the fundamental nature of being human. There are things, there, there are moral rights we have, moral obligations people have towards us based just on the fact that we are human beings. We don't achieve them and we can't lose them. Human rights is both a moral and legal concept. Uh, it's, most people believe that the relationship, most people who, who are boosters for human rights at least, believe that the relationship is something like, we all, morally speaking, have these rights, and one of the rights we have is that they be translated into effective legal regimes for their protection. The reason why there ought to be human rights treaties, in a nutshell, is that the treaties reflect the moral rights we already have. It is historically just true that the current way of thinking about human rights in international policy bears a lot of marks of particularly Western traditions of thinking about morality and rights. It's a question whether or not um, that's bad. And, you know, it's also easy to overstate this. Sure, the, the you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights shows its roots in largely Western traditions of thought, but as human rights campaigners from other, from non-Western cultures will point out, you know, it's not like Africans didn't value democracy until Western people told them about it, right? There were indigenous traditions of democratic values. Um, many Asians who don't hold with the Asian values critique will say this is, you know, we had a Chinese democracy activist as a as a, one of my colleagues on faculty for a number of years, and she would say this is basically just hogwash, right? Chinese value free speech and free association just as much as anybody else. They, you know, it's not as this picture where people from Asian cultures just really love knuckling under to larger groups is just not true. Um, and when you get into the weeds, there are lots of categories of things that have been claimed as rights. Uh, the conversation is not over if I convince you all that there are, in fact, some human rights. We still have, would have lots to fight about about what should show up on the list.